And so let's proceed now with the analysis of variance, which would be a specific calculation testifying to uh, this idea that we just had, that the treatment means are not the same. So let's set up the hypothesis that the treatment means are the same and test it and see if we can reject the hypothesis using an analysis of variance table, okay? So let's come over here to the, our analysis of variance table. And as you remember, you can't do an analysis of variance without a mathematical model. And behold our mathematical model. We say that all the observations in our little table can be accounted for in terms of mean performance, plus little impacts you get for being in various treatments. That's what those tau sub j's are. And then there's old mother nature coming along, sprinkling errors on top of everything else. All that summing together, giving you the individual observations y. And of course, we make the usual assumptions about the errors, that they're normally and independently distributed with mean zero and a homogeneous variance sigma squared. Well, what do you say we go through the calculation for this uh, set of data? Now, I'll just do this very quickly. The crude sum of squares in this case was a whopping big number, 117,000 and some odd. And of course, it has 28 degrees of freedom. There are seven treatments, four observations in each treatment. The next thing we do, of course, is get the correction factor or the correction for the mean, if you will. And that's a whopping big number too, like 116,700 and some odd. That cost me a degree of freedom. You remember that degree of freedom was really spent in getting the grand average of all the observations. So that would give me for my corrected sum of squares uh, a modest number, 451.8571, and it would have 27 degrees of freedom. Now, if there were no treatment effects, gang, that 21, 27 degrees of freedom divided into that sum of squares would give me an estimate of the variance. But we suspect there may be treatment differences after all. So what do you say we take this 451 and split it into two components, a component due to the treatment sum of squares and a component due to residual or error sum of squares. In other words, I'd like to compute now a sum of squares associated with the treatment effects. Now, do you recall the formula for getting the sum of squares associated with treatment effects? It's a real easy formula. I have it over here on the board. And it says what we're supposed to do is take the treatment totals, square them, divide by the number of observations in each total, and then sum up all these quantities for each of the K classifications, and then finally subtract the correction factor. In our example, N1, N2, and Nk, all these Ns are equal. There are four observations in each one of the classifications, and so the little formula collapses down to 1 over N times the sum of the squares of the treatment totals minus the correction factor. Well, we've done that calculation. Let's just enter it in here and uh, pull on ahead with our uh, analysis. Well, let's see now. Uh, the uh, treatment sum of squares came out to be 262 and a bit. That cost me six degrees of freedom. Why is it six, gang? It's six because there are seven treatments and the algebra of the problem constrains those seven effects to sum to zero, right? So when I know six of them, I know the seventh one automatically. There are six degrees of freedom consumed in estimating the treatment effects. Well, now, if I subtract the treatment sum of squares away from the uh, corrected sum of squares, I'll get the residual sum of squares. That turned out to be 189 uh, with 21 degrees of freedom. And now, three guesses what I do next. That will give me the estimate of the variance. And the estimate of the variance comes out equal to 9. Uh, that estimates sigma squared. <laughs> and you'll all remember a little while ago, I got the pooled within estimate of the variance. And what did it come out to be equal to? It came out to be equal to 9 uh, with 21 degrees of freedom. Now, this doesn't seem, the analysis of variance calculation doesn't seem like the swift way of getting the pooled within estimate of the variance, but you find out it is the standard way by which we do this calculation. Okay, let's test that hypothesis now. Enter stage right here, and somebody says, I declare there are no differences between the treatments. All those tau's are zero. There are no differences between the treatment means. And you'd say, oh, oh, well, if that were so, then this sum of squares, the treatment sum of squares, divided by its degrees of freedom would provide another estimate of the intrinsic variability of the data. And so I've done that division, and I get a 43.81, and that would estimate sigma squared, given that the tau j's, all those treatment effects were zero. And now we're back at an old familiar stand. We have two numbers, both parading around, claiming to estimate sigma squared. The 9 claims to estimate sigma squared, and the 43.81 claims to estimate sigma squared, each with its appropriate degrees of freedom. And so let's do the appropriate F test. So the F test with 6 and 21 degrees of freedom turns out to be 4.86. R. Now here's the problem. Is that an unusual value of F? And so what we'll have to do now is look up 
the F ratio uh, for an F distribution having, in this case, 6 and 21 degrees of freedom. Well, what do the F distributions look like in general? Well, we can see a display of the F distributions uh, over here on the chart. And you'll notice that these F distributions are skewed. And uh, although our particular F distribution is not here, uh, you will notice that um, uh, our F distribution will, in fact, look very much like the Fs we see here. And the trick is what it will be the critical value of F. A value of F will leave 5% in the tail of the curve. And the way we find that out is by looking it up in a statistical table. Now, most standard textbooks in statistics will have an F table, uh, just like they have a T table and a chi-square table and a table of normal deviate. I have to look up an F with 6 and 21 degrees of freedom. 6 and 21. Now, this is a little harder to memorize. Comes out to be 2.57. So given our particular F distribution, out at 2.57, that would leave 5% in the tail of the curve. Okay, gang, what F did we observe? And we observed a value of F larger than 4. As a matter of fact, our value of F was equal to uh, 4.86, whereas the critical value of F was only 2.57. That's a rare event F. When we observe a rare event F, what attitude do we take towards the hypothesis? We'd say out with the hypothesis. In other words, the hypothesis that there is no difference between those treatment means, or equivalently that all those tau sub j's are equal to zero, that hypothesis is dispensed with. We throw it out, we reject the hypothesis. Well, gee whiz, you'd all like to say, I knew that by just looking at that geometric display you showed me a moment ago, and you'd be right. And in fact, gentlemen, the real way to display the information in the data, the meaningful way, is not necessarily to do the analysis of variance calculations, which is detailed and precise, to be sure, but rather just to display, as we see here, the various averages plotted out with their appropriate reference distribution. And if you were to show those reference distributions, or particularly these critical values of the reference distribution, and observe that as I flash that back and forth, it was clear that there was no single position which would encompass all those averages. That would be a meaningful display of what was on, going on in those data. This brings us to some special comparisons. Now that we've decided that there are real differences between those treatment means, people are now anxious generally to get down to specific comparisons. For example, they would like to compare uh, whether treatment six was different from treatment three. How would you feel about that test? Well, using this approximate geometric method, you could just see if you could locate the distribution so that both 3 and 6 fell within the same distribution. You'll notice that there are lots of locations that the distribution can take, which makes it reasonable that 3 and 6 are both members of the same family. So you could not reject the hypothesis that there was a difference between treatment 6 and treatment 3. How about treatment 6 and treatment 7? Treatment 6 is, has an average of 70. Treatment 7's way down here has an average of 60. How do you feel, gang, about the hypothesis there is no difference between the mean of 7 and 6? Well, by golly, you know, you just can't locate that distribution and get both those averages together within the same distribution, so that would be rejected by the data. So this geometric display does, in fact, give you an opportunity of making lots of tests of hypotheses. Or can I do those specifically using the analysis of variance table? And the answer is yes. You do these tests specifically by constructing things called contrasts. You see, you're trying to contrast one treatment against another treatment, or one group of treatments against another group of treatments. What's a contrast technically? Well, a contrast gang is nothing more or less than a linear combination of the observations. It's a very uh, familiar kind of a statistic. A contrast is a linear combination of the observations. But, right, it's constrained. Those little constants which we place in front of each of the y's must sum to zero. See that? Now, if you want to do a test of hypothesis about a particular contrast, such as the difference between the average for treatment six and the average for uh, treatment uh, seven, or I should say the mean of treatment six and the mean of treatment seven, then you would merely set up the following T statistic. There'd be your comparison between those two averages. The expected value of that statistic We'd say was zero. We didn't believe there was any difference between those treatment means. And then we divide down by the square root of the variance of the statistic. So you could test that hypothesis. You could test the hypothesis about any contrast using the T statistic. But you could also test it in the analysis of variance table by constructing what is called the contrast sum of squares. 
and the contrast sum of squares is very easily obtained. You merely take the contrast square and divide down by the sum of squares of the AIs, those little constants. Now these formulae that you see here are really quite important and they'll become very important later on when we're talking about the factorial designs. But any test of hypotheses that you wish to make can be made in explicit terms in the analysis of variance table. There's only one other codicil I must uh, bring up here, and that concerns orthogonal contrasts. You're trying many contrasts. You may want them to be orthogonal. So suppose you had a second contrast, so another linear combination of the observations. If the contrasts were orthogonal, then when you took the inner product between the constants used in the first contrast and the constants used in the second contrast, they'd come out equal to zero. We'll spend a little bit more time on that later when we discuss these other experimental designs. But let's return to this discussion right here. Let me play a game with you, okay? Watch the, watch the following, gang. Is treatment six different from treatment three, do you think? No, okay? You could locate the two averages within the same reference distribution. All right, is three different from four, five? No. Is four, five different from one? No, and you can <laughs> well see what's coming, right? Is one different from two? No. Is two different from seven? No. See, the data will not testify to those specific differences, but let me ask you the following, right? Is six different from seven? And the answer is yes. It's true that the data do not have the strength, the power, if you will, to distinguish differences between, say, six and three, but by golly, they do have the power to distinguish differences between six and seven. This is like a lens, or the inverse of a lens, if you will. It shows the, what you can see in the data is constrained by, if you will, the limits of the reference distribution. And so we can see some real differences in the treatment comparisons, and we cannot see uh, some of the others. Now, there are lots and lots of different treatment comparisons which I could make. In fact, since there are seven averages, there are seven factorial different contrasts or treatment comparisons which I could cook up. Now, let me issue you an important warning when you do these sort of multiple comparisons among all these, treatment com all these treatments. And the warning is just is as follows. Do not attempt to do all possible tests, but only those few tests which, in a sense, you had in your mind before you collected the data. And then as a practical effect, you are certainly also entitled to test the few additional hypotheses which your mind's eye cooks up upon looking at the data, you see? But don't try all the tests of hypotheses. And why do we say that? Because each one of these tests is made with a certain probability. You see, the probability statement for any one test would be, the, prob the significance level, if you will, be 5%. Now, if I do many, many tests, many, many tests indeed, then the overall error rate, as the statistician would say, would be vastly increased, would no longer be 5%, but something in excess of 5%. So we hope that you will not attempt all possible comparisons, particularly when the number of treatments is large. And k equal to 7, as it is in this example, is a reasonably large a number of treatments to be comparing. So in designing such experiments, the first thing you would attempt to do, of course, would be to get the same number of runs within each one of the uh, treatment classifications. And then you would compute the averages, and you'd get the pooled within estimate of the variance, and you'd plot those averages, and you'd compute the reference distribution, and that's what you would display in your report. And the details of the calculations, the analysis of variance table, and the specific F tests and so forth that you'd cook up, uh, you could relegate uh, properly uh, to an appendix. Okay, well, it's been a very simple experimental design and experimental analysis, but at least we have now an objective way of determining what is really going on when we have a display of data like that. Now, the fundamental decisions, of course, will be made on the basis of not only the information in the data, but the information surrounding the data as well. But at least we've got the data to testify for itself by this particular analysis. Well, I tell you, I think it's about time we got the lab assistant to bring back our, uh, our impact tester here, and we ought to perhaps try a few more of these trials. So what do you say uh, we do another test here? I'm going to have to get this out of the way, and then take this gizmo out, and put another one in. Set the needle to zero.